have an incredible keynote session for you this afternoon uh, to close out TLC 2019. So I'm gonna hand things over to Dr. Newton Miller to introduce our keynote. Well, hello everyone, and, and it's an honor to, to introduce this, this young champion right here. But I have to say this, if you know me from Ashford, you know I'm, I'm pretty, say what I'm thinking. When I was uh, approached to introduce Dr. J. Luke Wood, um, knowing that his presentation was on microaggressions and, and inequities in color and, and how it affects, you know, a men of color in the educational setting, I had to laugh because me introducing Dr. J. Luke Wood could be perceived as a microaggression in itself. You know, the black guy introduces the black guy. So let me kind of just wipe that all out for you and let you know that, first of all, the people who, who approached me, I know them personally, and I'm very positive that wasn't part of the thinking. Our work is similar, uh, Dr. Woods and myself. And secondly, I want to say personally, to me, it's an honor to introduce this young champion. Do you know that he, the work that he's doing on his universe, at his university, San Diego State University, one of the uh, most diverse uh, campuses on, in the country, is changing, he's setting trends and changing how other universities are addressing equity and, and diversity on their campuses. And the work that he's done with the community colleges, uh, um, the, the equity assessment lab, I sat in several of his, uh, used to have uh, a monthly, I think they were um, um, seminars, and I sat in several of them, bought the books and things, and I used some of those things in the courses and stuff that I designed. And when I go, you know, to, to present at other universities, but what you might know him for, if you're not really familiar with any of his work, is a course that he, he uh, ran online, a virtual eight-week course called Black Minds Matter. I had the opportunity to be the facilitator here at Ashford University. Now, that course had over 10,000 logons, individual logons, for an eight-week period consistently. Now, one logon might not be one person. It might be a group of people. So 80,000 logons over an eight week period. This young man is changing how we are approaching education across the country. So as far as I'm concerned, in my mind, he's a modern day hero for underserved and marginalized populations. So if I were in the same room with you right now, I would say, get on your feet and give this young man a round of applause to show him how much we appreciate him. But since you're at home, I'm gonna actually do two things. Number one, I want you to open your gates. I'm talking about your eye gates, your ear gate, your mind gate, and your heart gate, because Dr. J. Luke Wood is not afraid to address the tough conversation. So as he does that, don't turn him off, be a receptor. And number two, I'm gonna ask that what you do is to commit right now to refeed on the information that he's about to impart on us. Because I guarantee you, the science he's about to drop on us has the potential to help us all grow. So without further ado, Dr. J. Luke Wood, Ashford University, and Ashford University, Dr. J. Luke Wood. Wow. That was an amazing introduction. I, I don't know if I can even live up to all that, Dr. Miller, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, it's good to be here. It's good to have the opportunity to address um, a community that's dedicated to uplifting those who oftentimes don't have the same uh, levels of opportunity. I know that the great work that Ashford is doing, I have uh, many close friends and colleagues who, who work for Ashford and, and who, who teach, who serve as administrators. And so um, when I saw this invitation, I was uh, incredibly uh, pleased to be able to participate in the conversation and to be able to offer what I think might be some important insights uh, for those who are oftentimes teaching people who come from historically underrepresented and underserved communities. And uh, so again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to, to Morgan, to Kate, um, to everyone who set this up and for the, of course the wonderful introduction and looking forward to talking about microaggressions. Um, but I also want to note that you can't talk about microaggressions without talking about bias. And so I'm going to show how those two concepts are really two interlinked concepts. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of men of color, but really this is not a, a solely a men of color conversation or a black male conversation or a Latino male conversation, but a conversation on, on race and how tacitly we see some people and we see names of individuals and we see uh, exchanges with different people and we might assume things about them that might not always be accurate and might suggest something um, that, they, um, that they may be lesser than or unworthy or unintelligent or dangerous. And so we're gonna talk about 
what that looks like, how it affects education, and what we can do to change it. But before I get going, I just want to let you know that uh, my center had a report that came out two days ago, and the report is called When They Teach Us. Now, um, for those of you who uh, know how to use the, the, the different functions of this, uh, uh, particularly like the chat room or the Q&A, like, I, I, I think it's important for us to, to, to engage. So feel free to, to post things in the, and I'll stop periodically and look at that and respond to that. But the report, When They Teach Us, is based upon the Netflix documentary, When They See Us. And I don't know how many people here have uh, seen that documentary, but it's by Ava DuVernay, and it looks at the Central Park Five. And it looks at the way in which those five young, innocent, young men of color, mostly black males, but men of color mostly, uh, were viewed as criminals, were innocently subjected to incarceration, and then went through horrible experiences in prison, their reentry back into society. And the, really the premise of the movie is the whole notion of when they see us is this assumption that when people who sometimes occupy the positions of law enforcement, and this is not to disparage law enforcement because there's many law enforcement officers who are fantastic, but for some people, when they see people who look different from them, when they see us, they see trouble, they see danger, they see a problem. And what we did in this week with the report that we released on Tuesday, it's called When They Teach Us, because our students can also be viewed as problems by school, college, university educators who, when they see people who are different from them, engage them in that way. So I welcome you to come to our website, check out the, check out the report, we're at seal.org, um, share it with individuals you think um, might be interested in it. And what it does is it looks at exclusionary discipline, specifically suspensions, and how school suspensions are an artifact of our implicit bias, the microaggressive ways in which we engage one another, and it creates a different experience. And I'll leave one point, data point before I, I get moving forward here. And that is that what we have found in our data consistently across all the reports that we've done is that when you think of a child being suspended, the highest suspension rates are always in middle school. And we're talking about um, young men of color, black boys, Native American boys, Latino boys. But when we talk about the greatest suspension disparity in comparison to their peers, it's an early childhood education, kindergarten through third grade. We're talking about the youngest of children, kids who, are, who haven't even been on the planet for a very long period of time and they're already being excluded from the very environments that are designed to build them up. And so that's the framework to which we come to this conversation. And so I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and jump in. And yes, I see people posting that they've seen it. And so hopefully, uh, it's a it's a movie that you will uh, check out if you haven't, and the report too. All right, so let's get going here. Implicit bias, right? Implicit bias is a necessary conversation for us to talk about when we're thinking about a conversation such as microaggressions. Now, um, what you see on your screen is a screenshot of Project Implicit. Now, Project Implicit is a national study that has multiple different instruments that measure the degree to which we see some groups who are different from us and we either extol those groups or we draw them down and think of them as, as lesser. And so you can see here a project implicit, you can look at individuals by, by weight, Arab Muslim, skin tone, those who are Native American, uh, women in sciences, uh, weapons um, in terms of white and black faces, presidents, a racial test, and there's a whole bunch more, this, I, this is a screenshot, so it goes on down the screen. But you can look at people and then look at these different groups, take this test and see to what degree do you prioritize some people and then you draw other people down. It's a short test. It doesn't take very long to do. I would recommend that everyone for your homework tonight, go and take at least one of these tests. And now when I say that, don't go take the one that you think you might score well on. Take the one that is a group that you might think that, you know what, I might struggle with. And use that as an opportunity to find out where you are. Because once you find out where you are, when it comes to these issues, then you have a tough choice to make. And that choice is to determine whether or not you're going to do something different 
or you're going to continue to do the same thing. And that's an important point to start from because if you want to do something different, you first have to know what you think about people who are different than yourselves. All right, so on your screen, jumping in, you have two different definitions and one description of implicit bias. And the first one is by the Kerwin Institute. I want to read that one first because I think that's a particularly good one. And it says that implicit bias is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an implicit manner, activated involuntarily without awareness or intentional control. It can be either positive or negative, and it says that everyone is susceptible. It doesn't say that some people are susceptible. It doesn't say that most people are susceptible. It says that everyone is susceptible. So everyone is is susceptible. All of us, myself, everyone on this on this uh, Zoom cast is susceptible to bias. Now, what I want you to do is just take a moment and look at the other description and definition. And then what I want you to do is think about what are some key words or key phrases that jump out to you in your mind when you think about what this means, what is implicit bias. So take a moment, read through those, and think about what are some of those key words or phrases. All right, so I'm gonna just show you um, the next slide here, the ones that stand out to me, right? It says here that implicit bias are the attitudes or stereotypes, right? You notice that one of the words that's highlighted is, is attitudes. So it's the ways that we think about things, it's the ways that we engage things, it's how our mind processes. And you'll notice one of the words that is uh, highlighted is involuntarily or unidentified. So oftentimes these are th things that we think about people who are different from us and we're not aware that we're doing so it's involuntarily it's unidentified and why does it matter it matters because it mediates attributions of quality how we think about people who are different from ourselves and more importantly it motivates our actions in terms of what we do and then to know what is being communicated it's based upon traces of past experiences things that we have experienced um, as with family members, with friends, things we've watched on the television, that we've seen on our phones, that we've heard on the radio, all those different mechanisms in which we can receive information informs that those traces of past experience, and if those experiences were informed by bias, which as human beings they definitely have been, then we are communicating that bias towards one another. Now, what we find is that there are certain conditions when we're more likely to convey the biases that we have than others. And some scholars have juxtaposed it on a continuum between what's called system two thinking and system one thinking. Now, in reality, there's no such thing as, as either being something one or being something of the other. There is no truly a system one or system two, right? There's really more so gradations across this continuum, but the two ends of this point really help to paint out how we communicate bias towards one another. So a system two has been shown that when we think about things and engage things in the system two context, we're less likely to convey our bias, whereas in a system one, we're more likely to do so. So system two, not as good. System one, better, okay? Or, I'm sorry, the other way around. System two is better because that's the one we're less likely to convey bias, system one, we're more likely to convey bias towards one another. My apologies. So system two is when we are employing our conscious reasoning. So I'm less likely to convey my bias because I'm being thoughtful. I'm employing my conscious reasoning. I'm being explicit about every word that comes out of my mouth. The words that I'm saying, how I'm forming those words, my body language, how I'm being received, my eye contact when it's culturally appropriate to do so. In doing so, that's more explicit. It's more controlled at how I'm engaging. And it's also a lot of effort, right? And it's harder for us to do that in our lives when we're teaching, when we're dealing with our families, when we're doing all the different things that are in our lives. It's hard to be as explicit and controlled and thoughtful. Because in reality, we have tons of things on our plates and we're responding in a moment and we're really engaging that system one. 
That's our unconscious reasoning where it's more implicit. What we say is more automatic because I'm flowing in the moment as things come to my mind and it's lower effort on my brain. So what my brain does is it fills in the blanks and it fills in those blanks with those traces of past experience which are informed by our biases. So what the research has shown is that when you employ a system one type of thinking, you're more likely and you're responding in the moment to convey bias towards one another. So you might have a question then, when am I more likely to convey that system one? And you're more likely to do so when three co conditions are in place, I, T, and S. Situations in which I, I have incomplete information, T, when my time is constrained, so circumstances in which my time is constrained, and S, when my cognitive control is compromised when I'm experiencing stress or insufficient sleep. Now think about those conditions. Incomplete information, time is constrained, experiencing stress. So I don't know about the rest of you all, but that represents every single day of my life. My Monday, my Tuesday, my Wednesday, my Thursday, every single day of my life is experienced by those three things because I work in the field of education. And you two working in the field of education, it is natural for us to experience these things. Incomplete information, I don't know all the information, my time is constrained, I'm experiencing stress. It's one of the reasons that we see so much work and research on implicit bias in education. But going deeper here is also one of the reasons why we see so much research on implicit bias in policing. Because if you think about it, an officer receives the information from dispatch that a young black male um, appears to be, oh, he's with a group of boys, he appears to have a gun, but I'm not sure it could be a toy gun. My time is constrained, I'm a police officer, I roll up into a scene, I don't know whether this person is really armed or unarmed, I'm armed, I have the ability to make life or death decisions in the split moment, and my time is always constrained, but I'm also in a job that is routinely stressful. So incomplete information, time is constrained, to experiencing stress, and then bang. That's how we get names such as Tamir Rice, right? a young black male who was shot with a toy gun when it was assumed to be a real gun. Names such as Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Oscar Grant, I live in San Diego, Alfred Alongo, and all these different names of individuals who've been slain by law enforcement. Why? Because of these three conditions that are oftentimes in place because we are all biased beings and we bring bias into the work that we do. And if we were armed with deadly force, we'd be making the same the same mistakes. Now that is not to in any way say that what happens with law enforcement isn't something that we should hold them accountable for because it is. But what it means to us is this, is that we have to understand where it comes from so that we can change the pattern and it comes from our biases. And so if you're engaged in education, if you're engaged in law enforcement or in healthcare or in hiring decisions, Whatever you're doing that, you have to be aware of the fact that you have bias and it influences everything that you do. Now, there's one additional consideration that's not talked about as much in the work and in the research, but is still absolutely paramount when we're thinking about implicit bias, and that is certain, certain circumstances when we have a heightened emotional state. So if you are triggered, if you have an, an emotional state where you have anger or disgust, that can also communicate and be more likely to communicate that implicit bias through that system on thinking. I'll read this on the screen. It says that certain emotional states such as anger or disgust can exasperate implicit bias and judgments of stigmatized group members, even if the source of the negative emotion has nothing to do with the current situation or with the issue of social groups or stereotypes. So let's say it's like this. You are uh, grading. You're getting ready to grade. You have all these different things that you have to do that are on your plate and you get a call and the water heater is broken yet again. And you're like, oh my gosh, we just got the water heater fixed. It's broken again. And now you're angry, you're disgusted. And then you go in and you start to do grading. You are more likely to convey bias when you do that because now you are in a triggered emotional state. So think about it, incomplete information, time is constrained, experiencing st stress, heightened emotional states, these are what characterize our lives. But it also is the reason why implicit bias is so pervasive in everything we see. So then remember, it's informed by those traces of past experience. So we have to think to ourselves, okay, so if I'm a biased being, what is it that I am conveying to the people who I am trying to support? And that goes to a concept called the primacy effect. 
the primacy effect uh, refers to the fact that individuals tend to give more weight to information presented earlier when forming opinions and making decisions. It refers to the fact that individuals tend to give more weight to information presented earlier when forming opinions and making decisions. So we can think about this in a number of different contexts. Let's take argumentation for an example, right? In argumentation, um, we see, and we oftentimes hear that the pers first person to make the argument has the strongest argument because everything that comes after that is a counter argument. Let me give you an example of that. Since when I look at this in this Zoom, it almost looks a little bit like a Brady Bunch thing. It reminds me of when I watch the news at night, right? And when you watch the news, you'll have um, a panel and you'll have a person who's the moderator, whether it doesn't matter which, which station you watch, whether it's Fox, MSNBC, CNN, you see these all the time where we're all in these individuals are in these boxes. You have the moderator who's gonna ask questions to a panel and there's a person on this side and a person on this side and a person on this side and another person on this side and just four people and we're all in one call together. And we're here to talk about whatever the topic might be. And I, let's say that I'm the moderator and then I turn to the first person and I say, can you go ahead and tell us um, what you think about X topic? And that person um, has thought to themselves that, you know, I wanna make a name for myself and for my organization. And they say something that's salacious, not on topic, but something totally out in left field. And then what you see is that then the rest of the conversation, rather than talking about what everyone was really there to discuss, is spent with people responding to what the salacious statement was said because that person has went out to make headlines for themselves. They steered the conversation off because they talked first. Again, individuals tend to give more weight to information presented earlier when forming opinions and making decisions. They have framed the conversation they have framed the narrative, and now everything that comes after that is a counter narrative. Now we see that in argumentation, but we also see that in socialization. The earliest experiences that you have when you were family members with friends, the things that you saw on the television, the things that you heard on the radio, whatever you engaged on in social media, whatever those early experiences were, those inform what you think about people now. So if you had an experience growing up where you were with a aunt or uncle, a tia or tio, and you were driving through a neighborhood and they said, you know what, roll up the window or make sure to lock the door. Or if you were watching the nightly news and always see these images of African-American men committing crimes and you think to yourself, are, are these the only people committing crimes? And the truth is it's not, but those were the ones that were more likely to be shown on television. And so it created this image that black men were criminals. Or if you grew up watching shows such as Good Times and Sanford and Sons and Cosby Show and whatever it might be, that you grew up watching these shows, you, you saw black men depicted in a very specific way. And it was usually as as laughable, as lovable, but not necessarily as people who are incredibly intelligent, maybe excluding one or one of those shows, right? So the certain things have been framed for us to think about certain people in different ways based upon our experience. So even if those weren't things that were overtly said to us, we took on those things. We carry around emotional baggage with us everywhere we go. And we bring that with us. Now, this is where I want to say something that's an incredibly important statement. Because sometimes when people hear a conversation on implicit bias, it makes them, makes them feel bad. And I want to say this. Being biased doesn't make you bad. It makes you human. Because all of us have bias. But choosing not to do anything about it, that's what's bad. It's the action of being a biased being and not being intentional about trying to do something different. The second thing that I wanna say right now is this. We have to separate intent from impact because oftentimes people can have a good intent yet have a bad impact. Let me give you one example of what I mean by that. I, my colleague uh, who runs the SEAL lab with me, you can see our logo there at the bottom. His name is Frank Harris. And Frank and I were out of college and we were doing a training. And the training was on implicit bias and microaggressions um, as part of the training, um, but the morning session that we did was on men and masculinities focused on help seeking. So there is a faculty member because at, at community colleges, they have what are called flex days. So people choose from a menu, right? So they didn't go to our session on implicit bias. They went to a first session 
on men and masculinities where we talked about help seeking and noted that sometimes some men are apprehensive about seeking out help. Then they went to a different session focused on building relationships and they were told if you see a student build a relationship with them because building relationships is the key to student success. So they went to these two sessions and they walked out. This happened to be a person who was a white male, very dedicated to students, wanted to do the right thing and said, you know what, the first student I see, I'm going to engage them, I'm going to talk to them, I'm going to build a relationship with them. So walks out of this flex day and sees, happens to be a black male. It's like, oh, there's one, walks up to him and then says, hi, I'm so-and-so, I teach here. I hear that you guys have problems asking for help, so what I'd like to do is to build a relationship with you. So, what sport do you play? Now, if you didn't hear the series of different microaggressions that just took place there, email me, we should talk. Um, but for those that did, you heard the fact that they put him down and he assumed that he was an athlete and he conveyed things in a way that were probably very hurtful to that individual. Now, I heard this story not from the faculty, but from the student. Because one day I was on campus, he pulled, he pulled me aside and said, you know what, can I talk to you? He says, and I want to tell you about an instance that happened. And it turned out that the faculty member, again, separating intent from impact, was a person who had a good heart, just didn't know what to do. And this student ended up being his mentor and serving as a guide and a coach for him. And they would meet periodically where he would give him suggestions on how he might engage students and things he might talk about with them. Because one, the faculty member was open to hearing it. And two, the student was willing to be the teacher in an institution when he shouldn't have had to be. So I say all those things to say that we, those are important framings for this conversation because again, people can feel some kind of way, but we have to talk about the difficult things. Now, one of those difficult things we have to talk about is that sometimes we want to think to ourselves, but wait a second, I didn't grow up in a family that was racist. I grew up in a, in a great family and, and we were taught to love everyone. But what we have to know is that even if people have not said things verbally, their nonverbal behaviors also educate our children. So here's a study from Skinner and colleagues. And this study looked at implicit bias in an early childhood setting. And essentially what the study did is it gave kids uh, video clips of educators engaging children in different ways. So they were educators who would give a kid a toy and smile or walk forward and, and, and give them a hug. And so it was these very positive images. And then some educators who they had a toy, but they would just quickly like hand it off to the child and they would frown and they would take a step back from the kid, right? And so they had these very positive images and these very negative images on these video clips and they had children watch them. Then what they did is they gave kids the pictures of those kids in those from those video clips and they said, rate the degree to which you find them likable. And probably to no one's surprise, if the teacher stepped back, frowned, and, and tried to give distance between themselves, the child said, I rate them as unlikable. And if they smiled and they gave them a toy and a big hug and those positive things, and they said, oh, I really like them, right? And so it showed that there can be things that we do that further reinforce that. But that's not the kicker of the study. The real root of this study is this. After they did that, they gave those children pictures of other children from the same racial groups. And then they asked them to rate the degree to which they either liked or disliked them. And this is what they found. That young children, I'm reading from the screen here, can catch bias from an infected atmosphere. That is by observing nonverbal bias exhibited by other people around them. What is more, preschool children generalize this bias to other individuals. So they rated all the individuals who looked like that child, if they rated them as unlikable, then they were similarly unlikable. Thus, exposure to nonverbal bias could be a mechanism for the spread of social bias throughout the world in the hearts and minds of children and adults. Very powerful. So we can get these images and things that we think about from all kinds of different places, from the media, from nonverbal behaviors, from attitudes of family members or friends. I, I jokingly say that everyone has at least one crazy uncle, and I have two. And one of them, unfortunately, is racist. And he says things that, that make me uncomfortable. Uh, he's the person that when you go to the restaurant with him, like you want to order before the, wait, before the waiter or the waitress gets to them because you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't want them to 
to come and, and spit in my food because we have individuals in our families, in our, in our communities who say things. And again, we don't actually have to tacit, uh, ta to uh, overtly uh, believe it, but if we've been exposed to that, it informs what we think about groups. Even if we consciously reject it, we may unconsciously ascribe to it. We also see this, of course, in law enforcement. So we're talking about education, but I mentioned Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, all these different studies, all these different cases, but there's been some studies that have been done that have shown why this occurs. And there's a number of study by Sadler and colleagues I would recommend. And what they've done is they've looked at police. And one of the studies uh, basically did what was an unarmed armed study. So they had white suspects and black suspects, okay? So white suspects and black suspects. And then those suspects were either armed or they were unarmed. So white suspects who were armed, white suspects who were unarmed, black suspects who were armed, black suspects who were unarmed. And then they were told, if you see the suspect who was armed, shoot them. If they're unarmed, don't shoot them. So they measured whether or not they shot, but they also measured the time that it took to make the decision to not shoot. So this is a discussion on implicit bias. It's a discussion on microaggressions. What do you think happened? Well, this is what happened. They found that police officers were more likely to shoot the black suspects both when they were armed and when they were unarmed. They also found that the decision to not shoot took longer when the suspect was black. We see this also in healthcare. So remember how I showed you at the very beginning that implicit association test tool? Well, that implicit association test tool has been used for a number of different very important studies in healthcare. And what they found is that Research supports the relationship between patient care and physician bias in ways that could perpetuate healthcare disparities. So in one of the studies that was done, they found that if they had a pediatrician who, was, uh, who took that test and was more pro-white, as opposed to being more balanced, that they were more likely to prescribe painkillers to white patients as opposed to black patients. Now, think about it. Why could that be? Well, they thought that the black patients were maybe more likely to use the drugs based upon stereotypes or to sell the drugs or they didn't perceive them as being capable of affording them or they didn't have the same level of empathy towards their pain or they perceived that they had a higher pain tolerance and therefore didn't need it. There's a lot of different reasons that have been put forth, but what they found is that there is different types of treatment. And when those different types of treatment affect the service that we provide to the people that we care about, then there's something that we have to think about in terms of what we're doing. We also find this in education. Uh, there's been some many really good studies done on implicit bias in education. In fact, we just completed one yesterday and presented some of the results today. But I'll talk about the work of Walter Gilliam, whom I'm a great fan of the work that, that uh, Walter does. And he's at the Yale Child uh, Center. And what they have is this software now, we have it here as well, where you put on these goggles and then it tracks your eye movements in terms of where it's going. So it can see what you're looking at. So what he did is he brought in preschool teachers into these booths where they were able to watch videos of kids. And what they were told is to look for the problematic behavior before it begins. So, you know, let me backing up here. So sometimes you might be in a bar or a restaurant at a sporting event or whatever it might be, and you get that sixth sense, like something's about to curl, something's about to happen, something is about to go down, and then it does. And so what they were primed to do as the participants in the study was to think about, okay, so uh, let's use that sixth sense and, and identify uh, the problem behavior before it begins. So they were given video clips of children engaged with one another and said, identify that problem behavior before it begins. And then they tracked their eye movements. And what they found was this, is that the teachers, the pre-service teachers, preschool teachers, spent more time looking at the black children than the white children. And what's more, they spent even more time looking at the black boys in comparison to any other group. But what makes this study particularly sad and difficult is what they found was this. And they found that there was this bias despite the fact that the videos were of kids just playing and engaging with one another. It's what we call a deception study 
in that there was actually no problem behavior for them to look at. They were told there would be, there was none. none. It was just videos of kids playing with one another. We also see this in hiring. So when you sit on a hiring committee or you're asked about, what do you think about a candidate? People use words such as the candidate resonates with me or something about them that I dislike, or they're likable, they're a great fit. I've seen this happen. In fact, I just recently experienced something where a candidate who was deserving of a position was assumed not to be likable simply because of their background. And it, it hurt me deeply to see that happen. And I had to engage colleagues to talk about that. Now, we see this in hiring. We see it in healthcare. We see it in education. We see it in policing because implicit bias is all around us. It affects everything we do and everything uh, we say. Now, one of the last studies that, uh, that I'll mention is this before we go into microaggressions, which is that um, the, you've probably seen these studies on a regular basis where they'll give people different resumes and they'll simply just change the name at the top of the resume. And then what they find is that people pick people who they think are more like them. So if someone's name is um, a name that is maybe white and I'm white, I'm more likely to pick that person. And if someone um, is name is different from mine, I assume it's from a person who's from a different group, then I'm less likely to pick that person. Now, there was a research study that looked at this and finally explained why it happens. So what they did, they followed the conventional resume study. Here are resumes. The resumes have different names at the top. And then what they did is they put good information on each resume and bad information. So good information. A person has been with a company for a long period of time. They've had successive levels of promotion. They've had more things that have been put on their portfolio. Bad information. I've been in one job and out of a job and another job and out of a job. Or I have gaps in my employment history. Or I've got a big, big title, but if you look at all the things that are beneath me, it doesn't look like I actually have very much, so is there something going on, right? So things that would be red flags. And what they found was this, is that people spent time when they thought it was a person based upon their name that was more like them, looking at the good information, and when they thought it was a person who was different than them, they spent more time looking at the bad information. They concluded that our implicit attitude was seen to be directing our unconscious eye movements to provide exactly the information it wants for a rational decision. This is both extraordinary and very worrying. So as we uh, go into now talking about the connection between this and microaggressions, I'm going to stop because I see that there's been the, that the chat window has been going off here for a little bit. So let me take a look here and see uh, those negative images are embedded in my mind. Yep, those are things that, that, um, that affects all of us. Um, yes, you're right. This is very similar to the work that Clark did with his experience, uh, experiments and uh, the blue eye study. Yep, ab absolutely. Those are all different studies that really have gotten at different types of microaggressions and different types of implicit bias. Um, there, I see that someone is saying that uh, police shoot black suspects no matter what. Yep, that was the conclusion of that study. Uh, there's a lot that's going on here. Yes, great conversation. And if there, I've seen any questions, I'll make sure to respond to those. So I want to pause for a second here and just say that if you have questions, please post them. I'll make sure to get to them. And then I'm going to go ahead and continue moving forward. So microaggressions. So we have implicit bias, but we don't just sit with that bias. We communicate that bias to people who are different from us. And the ways that we do that one of the ways is through microaggressions. According to Daryl Wing Sue, they are brief and commonplace, daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults. So think about it as the, the subtle things that we say that put people down or invalidate them. The most common example of a microaggression is this. Um, when someone sees someone say something and it sounds really well done and that person is a person of color and they say to them, wow, you're so articulate. Now, they say, wow, you're so articulate, not just to say that, but with a sense of surprise because they didn't expect it. So this brings us to a core concept of microaggressions, which is this, is that 
it's, I'm gonna go to forward to this, that it's not what's said, it's what's really said. It's not what's said, it's what's really said. And I know that we're not in, a, in an auditorium together, but I do believe in call and response uh, coming from my community. So please join me in, in this. It's not what's said, it's what's really said. Now, what are the messages that are really said? You're different than us. You don't belong here. You're not intelligent or capable. People of color are lazy and don't care. Your experiences and perceptions are wrong. You're being too sensitive. Or you're a criminal. You're dangerous. Racism doesn't exist. You're not of worth. Now, these aren't the messages that are ever said. But these are the messages are what's really said. Now, there's different types of, of microaggressions. You remember, based upon Sue's taxonomy, they can be environmental. They can be public. They can be private. They can be verbal. They can be nonverbal. I'm focusing primarily today on those that are in the red. Those are both public and verbal. But I've also put some examples in here because I realize that some of the work that you do, of course, is also in teaching people online, particularly using asynchronous methodologies, that these things can be communicated to our students, our community students can communicate it to one another. And so I've also put in some examples of that. So let's move forward. There are a whole host of different types of microaggressions. In general, you can classify them in three categories, micro assaults, which I don't have on the screen because those are kind of the normal types of racism. I think that everyone probably doesn't need a training on what those are. There's micro insults. When we insult someone, their intelligence, we assume they're criminal, we think of them as lesser than, we denigrate their culture, we assume that, they're, that if they do well, they must be different than people who are from their communities or we assume that they're athletes. And we can also invalidate people, assume that they're not from here or that they don't belong here or that we don't see them or that only the people who have worked the hardest succeed or we deny the individual experiences that they have or if they're a person of color, we magically assume that they're the principal to fix everything that deals with people of color so that we don't have to, right? So those are a whole host of different types and we can't get into all of them, but I want to cover some of them that I think are the most pervasive. So an ascription of intelligence. This is when we assign a degree of intelligence to a person based upon race, right? So implicit bias where we assume that they're not as intelligent because we've never seen them in that way and then so we therefore communicate to that, that to them unintentionally. So I already gave the example, wow, Luke, you're so articulate, right? But another example could be, you write so well. Uh, I am amazed, it is amazing, it should say that. Um, or one of the things that we have found with our work on uh, community colleges uh, in particular is that a faculty member will be in the classroom, again, well-intentioned, first day of class, students are walking in, they see a person of color walk in, they say, oh, this is a calculus class, are you sure you're in the right place? They're, in their mind, they're being assistive. They wanna make sure that the student finds the right class, but they assume that the student didn't belong there because they are from a certain community. So they actually put them down when they were actually trying to help them. Again, separating intent from impact, but it still have to realize that there is a negative impact that comes from it. Now, um, or when we would have group projects, I would be the last we picked because they would assume I don't know as much as they do. I found that whenever I had group projects, when I've taken online classes, when I've been in person, that when uh, people have known that I'm, uh, that I'm African American, that sometimes they didn't want to work with me. Now, when it was an online setting and there was no pictures and they saw Luke Wood, they probably didn't do that as much, right? Um, but the, these are things that we have to be aware of. Assumptions of criminality. Now, this is one that really affects our students. This is when we assume that a person of color is dangerous, criminal, or deviant based on their race. And that's why I began with the whole conversation on when they see us and then our new report, when they teach us. So here are some common examples clutching one's purse or wallet as a black or Latino person approaches or passes. Here's an example that might be relevant to your setting. Assuming a student cheated when they've written something that exceeds your performance expectations, right? It, I, I view this as what happens when a student exceeds low expectations, when students outperform low expectations. Well, maybe they must have cheated. They must have got around the rules somehow. Let me give you a one personal example of that. And I say personal, but it's actually not personal. It's actually from my identical twin brother. And we went off to college together. 
And when we did, uh, he took a class in Spanish and he had taken Spanish classes throughout high school. And so he was actually pretty strong. And so he goes into this class and I remember him calling me beforehand saying, you know what? I might be able to challenge this class because I think I'm going to be able to do really good. So he goes into the class, feels, takes the first few class sessions, feels like he's really comfortable, gets to the midterm. Midterm comes up and my brother, Josh, goes, he takes the test and turns it in. Next week, teacher comes back, hands back out the test. Everyone has grades on the top, except his just says, come see me in my office. So he's like, oh, okay. Maybe she's gonna tell me that um, I don't need to be in this class, that this is too easy for me, and that I should just challenge the class and move on. And so he was excited. He called me, excited, elated. This was what was going to happen. Except that's not what happened. He got to her office and she said, I don't know exactly how you did this, but we think that you cheated. So we need you to retake the test right now. And then on the spot, handed him the test and forced him to take it right there on the spot. So my brother sits down and retakes the test, humiliated that he would be assumed to be a cheater, that he would assume to have done that, but he retakes the test. He sits there, he takes the test, and he hands it back to her. She sits there and then she grades it. And then she says to him, I don't know how you've done this a second time, but I'm not gonna tolerate this in my class and gives him an F on the exam and it says that he cheated. So my brother being hurt, feeling bullied, being offended, decides that he's gonna take the test now to the department chair. He goes, he explains the whole thing to the department chair and the department chair says to him, now Josh says, do you really wanna begin your college career by uh, challenging grades from your professors? And that was his experience. Now, we actually ended up together writing about this in Huffington Post. Um, we have an article in Huff, Huff Post called uh, Too Smart to Succeed, Too Good to Win. And it looks at, in different types of settings, what happens when people of color outperform low expectations. And the underlying assumption is we must have cut corners, we must have cheated because we couldn't have possibly have done it. Now, is that all educators? Of course not. Does that mean that these are individuals who are bad people? Not necessarily. We have to separate intent from impact, but realize that it still has a very deleterious negative impact. So next example, occurs when a, a, person, a white person is given preferential treatment over a person of color, being mistaken for a service worker. Um, now, I wanna say this, uh, a person of color being mistaken for a service worker, there's absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, it's a, uh, a great thing to be a person who pr provides service to others. But when you automatically assume because we look like this, that we're service workers, then that's when it becomes a problem. Or a professor responding to emails from certain students more quickly from others because they're prioritized. I just dealt with that with a student here who came to me to explain that he actually missed out on a scholarship because a professor responded to all these other students and waited two weeks to respond to him. The only difference between him and the, other, and the other students was that he was a person of color. Or pathologizing culture. Now this is more so, this is the internal conversation amongst us educators. How sometimes we might say things to one another um, about students. The, that student's lazy. They don't care. They're not really here to learn. One of the things we see oftentimes in our work with community colleges is the statement, well, they're just here for the financial aid. They'll be gone by census, right? Thinking about our students in those negative ways. Here's another one, different norming. This is when we extol someone while drawing down their community, right? When I was talking about those blacks, um, I wasn't really talking about you because you're different. Or when I think of you, I don't think of you as Asian. I, I think of you as one of us. You're not like the rest of them. You're different, you work hard, right? So extolling a student while then saying something negative about their community, it creates a very difficult experience for people who come from communities that rarely receive validation from educators. Athletic boundedness, I think I've already discussed that one. You look like a ball player. By the way, if you didn't know, um, I'm a professional athlete. Actually, I'm not. I've just been asked so many times whether I, I am, I just, figured that maybe I should just say that I am. Whenever I get into an Uber or a taxi 
or a lift dressed like this, especially when I'm with a group of, of other men of color and we're doing the same thing. Oh, what team are you with? I had a student tell us one time that a professor asked him what team he was with. He said the debate team. Um, outsider on own campus, I'll skip through that one. Colorblindness. Now, this is the one that, that people struggle with the most, I think. And this is when we want to say that we treat everyone the same, but that's not what we say. It's, the, it's called colorblindness, the denial of pretense that a white person does not see color or race. So when I look at you, I don't see color. America is a melting pot. There's only one race, the human race. Now statements like that, what people I believe are trying to say is that I've been taught, I've been raised to treat everyone the same, to treat them in a way that acknowledges them and validates them and values them. But when you look at a person of color and you say, I don't see color, then you don't see them, right? So this is one where the intent of what is said is not what is the resulting impact. So we have to be really careful about the language that we use because as a person of color, I'm proud to be a person of color. So when someone tells me they don't see color, I think to myself, well, then you don't really see me. Now I'm gonna close with this because I think this is important. I don't wanna just raise problems and problematize. I also wanna offer solution. And the solution that I would offer today is what we call the Raven approach. And we use this to train all of our, uh, every search committee that we have at, at my institution. And this is something that my colleague Frank Harris and I developed, the Raven approach. And it's what we can do to respond to microaggressions when they occur. So the first thing we have to do is R. We have to redirect. We have to intervene. We have to correct. We have to pull aside. When a microaggression has been said, when someone has says something that is a microaggression, we can't just let it stand. When they have written something that is a microaggression in a chat room or in a paper, we can't just let it stand because when we do, we have to realize that that means that we are letting harm perpetuate. We have to intercede. As educators, we have a responsibility to do so. The next step for us is not to push back and denigrate because that will just close them down, but to ask probing questions. You wrote this. What did you mean by that? Or I think I heard you say this. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding. Were you saying X? Using questions as a way to help them understand why what they said, what they wrote, how they engaged was something that was hurtful or harmful. And now, once that is made clear, then I offer, offer that we should then have values clarification. You know, in this department, we work hard to create a space that is safe and welcoming for all of our students. Or what you, what you are saying is not really consistent with our institutional values that prioritize inclusion. Then, the next step would be to emphasize our own thoughts and feelings. You know, when I heard you say that, I want you to know that I think people from that community might make, take that to mean this. Or I know people who come from that community or who are part of that group, and I think they might be hurt by what you said. And then next steps, what is the action that they have to take? How is harm going to be reduced? So let me give you an example. A professor was facilitating a discussion chat on police brutality. It was a difficult discussion because there were people in the chat room who had personally experienced challenges with law enforcement and others who felt that the conversation was disparaging police officers. During the chat, one student wrote, there are certain communities that are more likely to commit crime. I'm sorry, but the truth is, and I'm not trying to be racist, but some black or Latino communities are dangerous. Come on, we all know that X place is not as nice as X place. Just watch the news. So yeah, I'm not totally surprised that there are more issues with police in those bad communities. So using the Raven approach, redirect, immediately intervening. Let me stop you there. What do you mean asking probing questions when you, when you say bad communities? What is meant by that? Have them articulate that. All right, so you mean that. Now, do you think that um, it's just those communities that are bad or it's just crime in those communities that are bad? Or, are certain types of crime, white collar crime, blue collar crime, more likely to be reported? And then values clarification, talking about uh, you know, the, the values that we have. So let me give you an example of what I would do. Let's say that this was in a public setting and someone said this. I said, let me stop you right there. Now, I heard you say bad community. What do you mean by that? Person responds and I say, you know, we work hard in, in this department to create an environment that is conducive of success for everyone. I just want you to know that I have a lot of friends who are from that community, and I think that they would be hurt to 
who have heard you say that. So in next steps, as you move forward, I just want you to be more thoughtful about how you articulate things about communities um, that are different from your own, right? Now, it's not that you have to use all these steps all the time. It depends upon the severity. It depends upon what's occurring. But realizing that the number one most important powerful thing that we have as educators is the power of the question, the power of why. And the reason that we have that power is because we're an educational institution. So we can use these as opportunities and learning moments, not only to improve ourselves, but to improve the overall experience for the students that we serve. So with that, I just want to close and I'm going to take maybe one or two questions since we're at time, but I really want to just thank you and hopefully that some of this has been uh, positive. All right, now I am going in here and looking at some of the things that were said. Uh, com comments that this is not rare, absolutely. Um, talking about how different instances were handled, absolutely. Um, someone thought I was an employee at a Chinese restaurant, although I was not wearing their uniform. That's an example of, yep, uh, that's a definitely a microaggression. I heard this as a light-skinned Latino male. I wasn't talking about you. You're not like the other Latinos. No, yeah, these are great examples of people who experienced this. And thank you for sharing because I know that can be difficult to do so. Um, I do. Want, it looks like there's no real questions other than <laughs> comments. There, there, there. Actually, there's a there's a couple. Um, they're further up. I'm not sure if you say that. Um, uh, there's one from uh, Florence. How well is this concept being a accepted. I've been teaching race and crime for decades. Some of the earlier concepts associated with microaggression are still not accepted. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Catherine Russell. She wrote, wrote about microaggression in the early 1990s. Yes. In fact, the concept of microaggression, microaggressions goes back to the, to the 70s um, and uh, from the work of, of Pierce. Um, and of course, it's been written about much more extensively um, absolutely familiar with that author. Um, this is what I would say. I would say that microaggressions um, are still a topic and concept that have been siloed, but the silos are breaking down. Um, we see more and more trainings that are starting to take place with people and more and more of an understanding. I mean, if you look on television, you see shows that regularly talk about microaggressions, and that's not something that, that used to take place. Blackish probably being blackish, grownish mixed dish, all of them being really good examples of that. Um, so we become um, also a modern family would be another example of that. So I think there's shows now that are doing more to make it a more common concept. Now, I do also think that more institutions are, are doing things around it. I know at our institution that you cannot sit on a hiring committee unless you've been trained in, in implicit bias and microaggressions in hiring. Uh, we just, we don't allow it. Um, and that's something that we think is important and something that as a chief diversity officer, uh, you know, I help to push for here. Um, so I, I think that it's becoming more common. Um, it's becoming more embraced, but it's a difficult concept. It's difficult for people to think of themselves in a way that they might harm people. We are, we are the type of beings that we don't want to think of what we do as being bad, right? Um, we don't want to think that we've hurt people. And especially when we're, we went into the fields that we're in to help people. Um, so I do think it's difficult in that way. Uh, but I do think that things are certainly improving. 